tonight inside the Supreme Court, a rare and exclusive interview with the longest serving justice, Antonin Scalia. You have to read the Federalist Papers. I don't think anybody in the, in the, in the current Congress could, could write even one of those numbers. Colorful and controversial, powerful and polarizing, Scalia's decisions have changed the nation. But what you've now got are the super PACs funded by billionaires, effectively trying to buy elections. And that cannot have been what the Founding Fathers intended. Yeah, I think Thomas Jefferson would have said the more speech, the better. Tonight, Justice Antonin Scalia on faith, family, the right to choose. And that was a theory used in Roe versus Wade, and it, it's a theory that is simply a lie. A rare glimpse inside the highest court in the land where the issues that divide America are decided. My Lucy with Justice Antonin Scalia. This is Piers Morgan Tonight. It isn't often a Supreme Court justice invites a journalist to come and sit down with them inside the court itself. But I'm here today in Washington to interview the longest serving justice, Antonin Scalia. Justices never comment on cases they've just ruled on or are pending. But that still left a lot of territory to cover, everything from his faith and family to his guiding judicial principles, his thoughts on campaign finance and politics, and his colleagues. It's all on the table tonight, my exclusive interview with Justice Antonin Scalia and Brian Garner, co-author of their new book. Reading Law, the Interpretation of Legal Texts. Justice Scalia, welcome. Brian, welcome to you too. Thank you. The book is very much a template for the way that you conducted your legal life. You are a man that believes fundamentally that the law in America should be based rigidly on the letter of the Constitution. That's what you believe, isn't it, fundamentally? Yes, um, give or take a little. Rigidly, I would not say, but it should be based on the text of the Constitution, reasonably interpreted. People that criticize you for this say, a lot of the Constitution was phrased in a deliberately vague way. That they realized when they framed it that in generations to come, things may change, which may put a different sure. impression on a particular piece of text. Right. Why are you not prepared to accept that that means you can move with the times, to evolve it? Oh, I, but I, I do accept that with, with respect to those vague terms in the Constitution, such as equal protection of the laws, due process of law. Uh, uh, cruel and unusual punishments. I, I fully accept that those things have to apply to new phenomena that didn't exist at the time. What, what I insist upon, however, is that as to the phenomena that existed, their meaning then is the same as their meaning now. For example, the death penalty. Uh, some of my colleagues who, who are not textualists, or not originalists at least, uh, believe that it's, uh, it's somehow up to the court to decide uh, whether the death penalty uh, remains constitutional or not. That, that's not a question for me. It's absolutely clear that whatever cruel and unusual punishments may, may mean with regard to future things such as uh, death by injection or the electric chair, it's clear that, that the death penalty in and of itself is not considered cruel and unusual punishment. But more and more Americans are coming around to thinking the death penalty is an anachronistic thing. You know, 50 years ago, even when you began, you're know, the longest serving Supreme Court justice, when you began, you know, the majority of Americans, big majority, would have been in favor of the death penalty. That is beginning to change. And you're seeing it, you know, for want of a better phrase, going out of fashion. One of the reasons being the introduction of DNA, establishing a large number of people on death row, didn't commit their crimes. How do you equate that? As a man of fairness and justice, how do you continue to be so pro something which is so obviously flawed? I, I'm not pro. Uh, people, I don't insist that there be a death penalty. All I insist upon is that the American people never proscribed the death penalty, never adopted a constitution which said the states cannot have the death penalty. If you don't like the death penalty, fine. Some states have abolished it. You're quite wrong that it's a majority. It's a small minority of the states that have, that have abolished it. The majority still, still permit it. But uh, I'm not uh, pro-death penalty. I'm, I'm just anti the notion that it is not a matter for democratic choice, that it has been taken away from the democratic choice of the people by a provision of the Constitution. That's simply not true. The, the American people never ratified a provision which they understood abolished the death penalty. When the Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause was adopted, the death penalty was the only penalty for a felony. So, and all we'd have to do is amend the Constitution. I mean, it can be amended. So it is changeable, but it's changeable by a process, not by asking the judiciary to make up something that is not there in the text. Right, but for example, on the Cruel and Unusual, I wouldn't have cited the death penalty so much as torture. I was fascinated by your interview, I think it was the 60 Minutes, where you said that, in your eyes, torture wasn't a cruel and unusual punishment, I think is what you said. Torture wasn't punishment. And I thought, well, hang on a sec. I mean, it clearly can be a punishment, can't you? If you're an innocent person, say in Guantanamo Bay, and you've expressed views about this too, say you've been picked up off a battlefield and taken to Guantanamo, but you are genuinely innocent, you were nothing to do with anything, and you get tortured, 
that, that becomes a punishment, doesn't it? No, I don't think it becomes a punishment. It becomes torture. And, and we have laws against torture, but I don't think the Constitution addressed torture. It addressed punishments, which means punishments for crimes. But what about if you're an innocent person <clears throat> being waterboarded? <clears throat> I'm not for it, but I don't think the Constitution says anything about it. I mean, isn't that the problem, though, with the originalism? No, it's, you, it's you, not the problem. It, it, it's, it's a problem of what, what does the Constitution mean by cruel and unusual punishments? No, nobody thinks... Isn't it, down to, <laughs> isn't it down to the Supreme Court to effectively give a, a more modern interpretation of the spirit of what that means? To adapt it to modern times? Well, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you don't think it is. Well, why don't you think it is? Well, I don't think it is because, uh, look, the, the background principle of all of this is democracy. A self-governing people who decide the laws that will uh, be applied to them. There are exceptions to that. Those exceptions are contained in the Constitution, mostly in the Bill of Rights. And you cannot read those exceptions as, as broadly as, as the current court desires to read them, thereby depriving uh, Americans of uh, legitimate choices that the American people have never decided to take away from them. And that's what happens whenever you read punishments to mean torture. Yeah. If you are sentenced to torture for a crime, yes, that is a cruel punishment. But the mere fact that somebody is tortured is, is unlawful under, under our statutes, but the Constitution happens not to address it, just as it does not address a lot of other horrible things. Brian, when you did the book, what did you argue <clears throat> most with Justice Scalia? Because he's, he's one of the world's great arguers. I feel like we're just warming up here. I love to argue. <laughs> he's done battle well, with, with them all. You know? Well, he's an intellectual giant. And uh, we, we had no debates in this book. In the first book, we had four debates where we had a pro and con. In this particular book, we had none. The biggest issue in the end we almost had a debate about, but he, he persuaded me we should, the, not to, was whether a murderer can inherit. Can a son, for example, murder his parents and, and move up his inheritance and still take uh, whatever the property is from his parents if the statute doesn't say anything about it. And we all feel that, that that's wrong. And I was at first arguing that there should be an equitable exception and that we absolutely have to prevent a murderer from inheriting. What did you say in response to that? I said, if you're going to be serious about textualism, uh, if the statute does not make an exception, it does not make an exception. And those states <clears throat> that hadn't made an exception amended their statutes. That's what happened. Take a short break. When we come back, I want to ask you why you think burning the American flag should be allowed, even though personally you'd throw them all in jail. Back my special guest, Justice Antonin Scalia and Brian Garnett, with co-author of his book. I left the viewers on a cliffhanger. Why you believe that people who burn the flag in America should be allowed to do so, uh, and yet you personally if you had the chance, would send them all in jail. Yeah, if I were king, uh, I would not allow people to go about burning the American flag. However, we have a First Amendment, which uh, uh, says that uh, uh, the right of free speech shall not be abridged, and it is addressed in particular to speech uh, critical of the government. I mean, that was the main kind of speech that uh, tyrants would seek to suppress. Burning the flag is a form of expression. Speech doesn't just mean uh, written words or oral words, it could be semaphore. Uh, burning a flag is a symbol that expresses an idea. I hate the government, uh, the government is unjust, whatever. If you're not sure, then in the end, doesn't, and no one knows the Constitution better than you do, doesn't it come down to your personal interpretation? of the Constitution, if it isn't clear-cut, which it clearly isn't, you in the end have no, to make no, no, don't, don't. A, an opinion, don't you? Well, don't forget this person has to be convicted by a jury of 12 people who unanimously hmm have to find that he was inciting to riot. So, you know, it's not all up to me. It, it would be up to me to say that there was not enough evidence for the jury to find that, perhaps. But ultimately, uh, the, the right of jury trial is, is the protection. I'm afraid, sorry, Ron. Well, don't you think this example of speech and reading speech and a fair reading as including uh, symbolic speech, there's a lot of case law about that, of course, but it's a good example of why we think strict construction is a bad idea. A lot of people think Justice Scalia is a strict constructionist, when in fact he and I both believe... What does that mean? Well, it really means a narrow reading, a crabbed reading of statutory words or of constitutional words, and it's a kind of hyper-literalism, which we oppose. We like a fair reading of the statute, a fair reading of the words, and in this case, speech. Well, let me, well, let me take up the issue of speech. Let's turn to political fundraising, which... At the moment, under your interpretation, I believe, of the Constitution, you should be allowed to raise 
money for a political party. The problem, as I see it, many critics see it, is that that has no limitation to it. So what you've now got are these super PACs funded by billionaires effectively trying to buy elections. And that cannot have been what the founding fathers intended. Thomas Jefferson didn't sit there constructing something which was going to be abused in that kind of way. I, I do think it's been abused, don't I, you? No, I, I think Thomas Jefferson would have said the more speech the better. That's what the First Amendment is all about. So long as the people know where the speech is coming from. But it's not speech when the first... It's all about money. To back up the speech. You can't separate speech from, from, from the money that, that facilitates the speech. Can't you? It's, it's, it's utterly impossible. Can, uh, could you tell newspaper publishers uh, you can only spend so much money in the, in the publication of your newspaper? Would, would, would they not say this is abridging my speech? Yeah, but newspaper publishers aren't buying elections. I mean, to, you know, the, the election of a president, as you know better than anybody else, you've served under many of them, I, is an incredibly important thing. Newspapers. It shouldn't be susceptible to the highest bidder, should it? Newspapers endorse political candidates all the time. What do you mean? They're, 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 they're almost in the business of doing that. Yes. And are you going to limit the amount of money they can spend do on you it? Think perhaps, Surely not. Do you think perhaps they should be? Oh, I certainly think not. I think, as I think the framers thought, that the more speech, the better. Now, you, you are entitled to know where the speech is coming from. Uh, you know, uh, information as, as to who contributed what, that's something else. But whether they, whether they can speak is, I, I, I think, clear in the, in the first Is amendment. there any limit, in your eyes, to freedom of speech? No, of course. Is, is it, what are the limitations in, in, to you? I'm a textualist. And what the provision reads is, uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. So they had in mind a particular freedom. What, what freedom of speech? The freedom of speech that was the right of Englishmen at that time. What well, is well, the difference are between speech about insurrection being unacceptable and speech as you're burning a flag? Isn't that a form of insurrection? No. Isn't no, it? no, no. Yeah, that's, that's, that's just saying we, we, we dislike the government. It's not urging people to take up arms against the government. That's something quite different. That's what I mean by speech urging insurrection. Speech inciting to riot or inciting to... Or shouting fire in a theatre. Yes. What about that? See, one of the more complex things about you, Justice Scalia, which I, I think is, has been admired and criticised in equal measure. The case I would put to you, where I think it's interesting where you dissented against something, where I think common sense would have dictated the opposite, was Marilyn B. Craig, a young girl who had been abused by a child molester. And she gave evidence through closed-circuit television. She didn't appear in court. And the abuser argued that this was unconstitutional because under the confrontation and under the Constitution, he should have been allowed to be face-to-face -face with his victim. Right. Now, what part of human decency or common sense says that he should have the right to be face-to-face -face with his young girl victim? Because you dissented against the Supreme Court. You decided he should be allowed to. All legal rules do not come out with a perfect, sensible answer in every case. The Confrontation Clause, in some situations, does seem to be unnecessary but there it is and its meaning could not be clearer you are entitled to be confronted with the witnesses against you and simply watching the witness on a closed circuit even when the witness is a young girl who's already been Whatever. abused and is actually traumatized by what happened what it says is what it says do you, do, you, do you go home at night when you dissent again in that particular case do you have misgivings about it person on a personal level or are you always able to divorce that from your, as you would say, legal responsibility to uphold the letter of the Constitution? No, I, I sleep very well at night, uh, knowing that I'm doing what, I suppose, what I'm supposed to do, which is uh, uh, to, apply, to apply the Constitution. I do not always like the result. Uh, very often I think the result is terrible. But that's not my job. Uh, I'm not king. And I haven't been charged with uh, making the Constitution come out right all the time. So. Let's, let's take another break. Let's come back and talk about one of the most contentious Supreme Court decisions of all, Roe v. Wade. You had very strong opinions at the time. I suspect you have equally strong opinions today, and we'll find out.